During World War II, the Axis and the Allies busied themselves with propaganda in an attempt to undermine each other's will to fight. One of the most effective ways of reaching enemy troops and civilians was via radio broadcasts. The Germans used a variety of British traitors to broadcast Nazi propaganda, and perhaps the best known to a UK audience was Lord Haw Haw, the cover name for an American-born Irish fascist named William Joyce, who made some regular and unsettling broadcasts in a mock upper-class English voice, being particularly notorious during the German invasion scare in 1940 and the Blitz on London that followed. Joyce was captured in May 1945 and later controversially tried and hanged as a traitor, even though it emerged that he actually held a British passport fraudulently and had been born in New York City, making him a US citizen until he took up German nationality during the war. The Germans employed men and women traitors, and my US audience may have heard of Axis Sally, a cover name for a series of female traitors who broadcast for the Nazis, but most closely associated with Mildred Gillers from Portland, Maine, who was imprisoned in 1949 for treason. But what about the Pacific Campaign? Any US veterans of that terrible campaign would recall the voice of Tokyo Rose, a female voice that came to represent Japanese villainy. But was Tokyo Rose a traitor? It has emerged that there wasn't one Tokyo Rose, but several Japanese Americans who broadcast. But one woman in particular was dubbed Tokyo Rose by the US media. Her name was Eva Toguri. So what kind of show did Toguri broadcast? It certainly wasn't the sneering anti-Allied propaganda of William Joyce, nor was it particularly sophisticated. Her show mixed in a friendly female voice with jokes and popular music. Hello, you fighting orphans of the Pacific. How strict. This is after her weekend, Annie, back on the air strictly under urine hours. Reception okay? Well, it better be because this is all request night. And I've got a pretty nice program for my favorite little family, the wandering bone heads of the Pacific Island. The first request is made by none other than the boss. And guess what? He wants Bonnie Baker, and my resistance is low. Mom, what taste do you have, sir, she said. Toguri's broadcasts were popular with GIs in the Pacific, and were all made after Japan had lost the strategic initiative, and America was beginning to push the Japanese perimeter back in its island-hopping campaign. The music she broadcast was especially welcomed by G.I.s, not to mention a young woman's voice, which was both humorous and a little playful. Greetings, everybody. This is your number one enemy, your favorite playmate, Orphan Anne, a Radio Tokyo. The little sunbeam whose throat you'd like to touch. We're ready again for a vicious assault on your morale. 75 minutes of music and news for our friends, I mean our enemies in the South Pacific. Well, uh, how are all my little darling little dopes tonight? Full of beer and belligerent? I know, you still hate us, but don't let, let that take you festering. It poisons the whole system. What you need is some good jive. I mean solid. Helps you relax. All set? Okay, here's the first blow at your morale. Two guys are singing and singing. Hey, Pop, I don't want to go to work. Will you still listening? Toguri's show, called the Zero Hour, contained no direct attacks on the United States. The reason for this was because her producer was an Australian Army major named Charles Cousins, who had been captured at the fall of Singapore in February 1942, and in 1943 forced to assist the Tokyo Rose broadcast by the Japanese.
Cousins, working under duress, was assisted in preparing the programs by two other POWs, Captain Wallace Ince of the U.S. Army and Lieutenant Norman Reyes of the Philippine Army. So who was Toguri? She was born in Los Angeles in 1916, the daughter of Japanese immigrants. Her upbringing was all-American. A Girl Scout and church-going Christian, she graduated from UCLA in 1941 with a degree in zoology. On a trip to Japan in July 1941 to visit a sick relative, she travelled with a certificate of identification and not a passport. Waiting to return to the States in August, she applied for a passport at the U.S. Embassy. Her request went to the State Department, but once Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941, her request was refused, and she found herself marooned in Japan. Interestingly, the Japanese tried to pressure her to renounce her U.S. citizenship, which she refused to do. Instead, she was permitted to do some clerical work in Tokyo to support herself, moving eventually to work at Radio Tokyo as a typist. In November 1943, the Japanese secret police, the Kempei Tai, selected Toguri to become a radio program host at the instigation of Major Cousins, determined that the broadcast he was being forced to make would be quite ridiculous and laughable to a Western audience, and he believed that Toguri's voice would be perfect for such a show. Toguri already knew Major Cousins and Captain Ince. It emerged after the war that Toguri had actually smuggled some food to them as prisoners of war held at the radio station. In fact, it appears that although Toguri would become closely associated with the Tokyo Rose Subriquet, she remained a loyal U.S. citizen, and she, cousins and ints were able to produce programs that any U.S. listeners would view as largely devoid of enemy propaganda value. The three of them were playing a dangerous game, but the Japanese station bosses never caught on to what Toguri, Cousins and Ince were up to, and hence the Kempei Tai never punished them. Between the summer of 1943 and the Japanese surrender in August 1945, Toguri made 340 or so broadcasts for the Japanese. She never called herself Tokyo Rose, instead using the name Orphan Annie. But even though Toguri's broadcasts were essentially harmless... She found herself in hot water when Japan surrendered. U.S. reporters scrambled to find and interview Tokyo Rose, offering up to $2,000 for her cooperation. She wanted to use the money to return home to L.A., and voluntarily came forward but was arrested in Yokohama and jailed as an investigation was made into her alleged treason. The problem for both General MacArthur's headquarters in Japan that delved into this matter, as well as the FBI that launched a five-year-long investigation, was the lack of incriminating evidence against Toguri. Her scripts had been written for her by coerced Allied POWs, and she herself had been pressured into broadcasting by her circumstances in 1943. She was no ideologue. In 1948, Toguri was transferred to San Francisco. There she was formally charged with treason, an offence that carried the death penalty. She had undoubtedly aided the government of Japan against the United States, and she eventually stood trial on eight counts of treason. Well, I can just really say I enjoyed in the King and uh, as far as the news announcements are concerned, I admit they're a little confusing at times. And uh, I often wondered... Uh, how many times the American fleet was going to be sunk before the show was over. Her defense team was led by Wayne Collins, an attorney who had a track record of defending Japanese-American rights following the forced internment of all Japanese-Americans in special camps for the duration of the war, a highly controversial order made by President Roosevelt that remains a contentious subject even today. Major Cousins was a witness for the defence after having been acquitted of treason by Australia in 1946. In the end, Toguri was found guilty on just one count, that she had made a radio broadcast during which she had mentioned the loss of ships following the Battle of Leyte Gulf in 1944. However, this accusation is in dispute, as no record could be found in any of her scripts for the radio programmes. It appeared that some undue influence and duress had been applied on both the jury and the court to find her guilty and make an example of her. She was fined $10,000 and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. 
She was paroled and released in 1956. In 1977, Taguri received a presidential pardon from Gerald Ford on his last day in office, and her citizenship was restored. Taguri died in Chicago in September 2006 at the age of 90. Her role as Tokyo Rose has been dramatized many times since the war, and regardless of the truth of her actions, she has been portrayed as an evil mouthpiece of Japanese imperialism. In reality, Taguri, Cousins and Ince actually managed the difficult situation they found themselves in quite well, and the propaganda value of the Zero Hour ended up being, appropriately, zero. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.